The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. And we say hello to Celine Marie Pascal, professor of sociology at American University in Washington, D.C., and author of Living on the Edge, When Hard Times Become a Way of Life. Celine Marie Pascal, thank you for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. Well, certainly our pleasure to have you with us. And, you know, as the title of your new book makes clear, this is a book about people living on the edge. But that's a common phrase. So for the purposes of this book, what does living on the edge mean to you? Um, well, unfortunately, it's a fairly common experience that we pass through in, in life. I think of living on the edge as um, being at the edge of an economic disaster. So rising rents, stagnant wages, um, having uh, where poor health trouble or car trouble can throw you into a financial crisis that's really hard to get out of. And for many families, it's become a way of life. It's not one of those, you know, periods in our life that we pass in and out of. Mm -hmm. Now, to write the book, you traveled the country to talk with people who are experiencing economic hardship. How did you decide where to go and why does place matter in the telling of the story? Mm, That's a great question. So. Every community has various levels of economic diversity in it. And I was looking for communities where there had been a high level of poverty for decades, because this affects everyone, not just the low wage workers in those communities. And it shapes things like uh, community resources and access to them, opportunities for employment, health care, pollution. And also being kind of invisible in the national narrative about what's going on in the country. What kind of questions did you ask those you interviewed? And in general, did you find that people were willing to share their experience with you? Um, For the most part, people were really um, easy to talk with. And there were there were some places where it was harder, of course, but I always started with a demographic form that asked, you know, basic information about their lives, their age, and that sort of thing, their income. But then when the interview, I would ask them, I would start by just saying, would you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, um, how would your friends describe you? Do you have a daily routine? What brings you satisfaction in your life? And uh, things like, you know, do you have any worries in your life? I also asked um, toward the end of the interview that if they could magically change three things about their community, what would they do? What would they change? And these are really broad questions that opened up the opportunity for conversation and follow-up questions. So for example, um, when someone talked about being really proud of a new pair of socks, you know, I, I would follow up on, you know, like to, to learn more about that or, so much to my surprise, in many places, women were very worried about human trafficking, sex trafficking. And so I would follow up on those things, of course. So now I'm wondering, when you're asking these questions, and it's those little things in life that sometimes can make a big difference in, in, in for somebody, a new pair of socks, uh, it could be a haircut, a new shirt, a new pair of shoes. Did you find that these little things were making that big a difference for those that had the opportunity to take advantage of them? Um, Yes. Um, The young man who talked about the pair of socks, for him, it was really a status thing that he had a 
fancy new pair of stock, socks from the store. But for many people um, in Southeast Ohio, being able to get a new coat, uh, they opened a, a, a store, a so-called store for poor families where they could kids could come and get jackets or whatever they needed for school. And most of them wanted to take away things for relatives. So a kid would come in and get a winter coat for himself or herself and ask if they could take a coat for a family member. There was a sense of um, these informal economies really being central to people's comfort and sense of dignity. We're speaking to Celine Marie Pascal, professor of sociology at American University, also the author of Living on the Edge, When Hard Times Become a Way of Life. And to some extent, this is a story about the way many people who don't live in poverty understand the experience. What is your sense of what many of us get wrong and what perpetuates that misunderstanding? Oh, gosh. Um, I think we'd have to start with just how we define poverty. So for a lot of us, we think that poverty begins with the federal poverty line. But for an individual, the federal poverty line is $12,880 a year income. That's about $1,073 a month. So when you think about that in relationship to rent and other bills, you can see that that federal definition of poverty is really ineffective. If you think about poverty as having trouble paying your bills or keeping food on the table or having to work two to three jobs in order to make that happen, then you have a different understanding of poverty. And this is where most people are trapped. And then we have a national narrative that really blames people for their own suffering. You know, they're lazy, they're not trying hard enough. And they identify poverty. We tend as a nation to identify wealth and poverty as part of personal characteristics rather than systemic structures. So I think those are the basic ones. Mm -hmm. Now, in listening to what people had to say, did you hear anything that was actually surprising to you? Oh, gosh, I was surprised by so many things in the course of this uh, journey. Um, at Standing Rock, there's an enormous crisis of missing and murdered women, sex trafficking, was introduced into this region in a massive scale by the fracking fields, nearby fracking fields that developed man camps in a demand for uh, prostitution. In Wyoming, there was an epidemic of head injuries, which I had never imagined before, but in many places, native men are beaten for sport by non-native people. In Appalachia, it was the opioid crisis, which is not just the sale of, um, the, of drugs, but the way that it unfolded because opioids aren't produced by backyard chemists. They're actually pharmaceutical companies working with business and government. So in Mingo, <clears throat> excuse me, in Mingo County, West Virginia, a pharmacy in a town of 400 people dispensed 9 million opioid pills in two years. And we had representatives, uh, Tom Marino and Orrin Hatch drafting legislation that actually encumbered the DEA from doing their job. I, I was just jaw dropped through much of this time. And in Oakland, I expected the tech industry to devastate the rental markets and it's certainly doing that but I was really surprised about the amount of lead contamination in poor neighborhoods. So in everywhere, you know, I, I feel somewhat familiar with the topic, with the experience, but I was always surprised by the reality and the complications of people's daily lives. Mm -hmm. uh, some of what you just said is absolutely startling to me uh, to, to hear it. Um, and as you state in the preface of the book, living on the edge is more is about more than, say, individual experiences. It's, it's about a nation in a deep economic and moral crisis. Expand on that thought for us, if you would. Well, in um, in 2018, national polls showed that 65 to 80 percent of the population was living paycheck to paycheck. And um, in 2020, we have 43 percent of households 
being unable to, fo- to afford basic bills of food, housing, transportation. So we have a major crisis and it's not one in which we're going to be able to um, get our way, get through it by charity. Generosity isn't going to be a substitute for justice at this moment. So responding to the crisis requires more than a sense of duty to help people who are less fortunate. It really requires a moral obligation to ensure that there is a self-sufficient life possible for everyone who's working, right? Or those who are not working to be able to make sure that the dignity of human beings is respected through self-sufficiency. And as you also state in the preface, ultimately this is a book about hope that lays out a vision for the future as honest as it is uh, ambitious. What did you hear from the people you spoke with that suggested hope? Oh, hope threads through all the narratives in the book. And sometimes it's an unfounded hope that things are going to get better um, when that seems incredibly unlikely in a realistic term. Sometimes it's a very determined hope that leads them to ensure that their kids will have winter coats or a place to go after school to get a hot meal. I think that readers will see that hope threads through the entire book in small, small strands. And by the time you get to the end of the book, the people I've talked to have created a very bold agenda for the future that is only possible if you have hope. Celine Marie Pascal, professor of sociology at American University, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Also, she is the author of Living on the Edge, When Hard Times Become a Way of Life. Celine Marie, thank you so much for your time with us today. We'd love to have you back again soon. Thanks so much, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. Corporate America has proudly elevated good moral values to a special place. That place is the trash can. Indeed, free market gurus assert that the only ethical obligation a corporation has to society is to deliver as much profit as possible to its big investors. Everybody else be damned. And they excuse any awfulness they cause by claiming that they, quote, broke no laws. But hello, they write the laws. So corporate immorality is always technically legal. America experienced this corporate dodge just before Christmas, when a line of supercell tornadoes ripped through the Midwest, demolishing buildings and whole towns, killing more than 90 people. It was called a tragedy. But those deaths were not destiny. We're not helpless in the face of tornado fury, for an effective, cheap defense is readily available. Safe rooms. Built inside schools, factories, shopping centers, and other buildings, people can safely shelter there during big blows, surviving even if the building around them is shredded. They've been proven to provide, quote, near-absolute protection from tornadoes, and it's long been proposed to amend building codes to require them in new commercial and public buildings. Such a provision would have saved many workers who were crushed inside an Amazon warehouse, a candle-making factory, and other buildings destroyed by December storms. But they died because members of a little-known industry control group, the International Code Council, had quietly vetoed the proposal, calling it overly restrictive and even declaring it's way too soon to do a knee-jerk reaction to tornado deaths. This is Jim Hightower saying all those buildings smashed by December's tornadoes were corporate death sites because their shoddy construction broke no laws. Let's ask corporate America if it's still too soon for Congress to mandate tornado safe rooms. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown.
Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to Hightowerlowdown.org. This social security measure, I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. What is the peril, as you see it, that remains? Well, there's a scene in the end of our book where House uh, leader Jim Clyburn, who, as we all know, is so close to President Biden, he's really frustrated with Senator Manchin. And he's saying democracy is on fire because the Senate Democrats aren't moving on voting rights. It's sluggish on the filibuster on Capitol Hill. And it's Clyburn who comes out of the civil rights movement saying democracy is on fire. And then we have a scene at the end with General Milley, the head of our U.S. military, in in terms of being the senior officer, really worrying about white supremacy, about whether January 6th was the precursor to something worse, and knowing that the rest of the world was watching. Uh, And with all the different currents in the world, uh, whether it's an aggressive uh, Chinese Communist Party or uh, threats elsewhere, like Russia with Ukraine. This is a world of peril confronting uh, American leaders, and it's a domestic front of peril. And it's a peril in terms of democracy uh, with voting rights being challenged uh, across the country. Is um, the peril Donald Trump? He, He represents a movement that is changing American democratic norms. And it's interesting as someone who's covered Trump for a decade to look at him now and to realize so much of what's happening in some ways has his his fingerprints on it, uh, but sometimes it does not. And what I mean by that is Trump sometimes is meddling in different states, pushing them to have so-called audits, which of course are not audits, Mm -hmm. uh, pushing them to have different voting activities so Republicans have more control. But a lot of times it's Trump allied people doing it on their own. And, And what I've really noticed as a reporter is Trump set off a fire that continues to burn inside the Republican Party when it comes to contesting the 2020 election, contesting voting. And he sometimes is directly involved, but oftentimes he's not. He's responsible, though, for pushing the party in that direction. Do you make anything of the fact that lately some of the uh, Trumpers themselves uh, seem to become disillusioned with Trump over his support of the vaccine? Well, that the Trump movement is not uh, so much a cult to Trump. It's something, as I said, he sparked, mm-hmm. but it has all these different pockets and you see different power centers emerging in the post-Trump presidency landscape. Sometimes it's Turning Points USA, that conservative youth group. Sometimes it could be someone like Candace Owens who interviewed Trump about vaccines and she has more skepticism about them uh, than than Trump. And she's a major voice on the right. Uh, Tucker Carlson, is his Mm -hmm. own power center on the right. And so you've seen a competition for influence inside the Republican Party and inside the conservative movement that wasn't necessarily uh, this way when Trump was president. And that comes to the vaccine as well. Well, And I think one of the central questions in your book, in Bob Woodward's last book, Rage, um, Margaret Sullivan touched on it in the Washington Post uh, on January 1st, 
if democracy is under siege, and you've indicated it is, James Clyburn says it is, I believe it is, uh, what is the role of the media? Uh, is the media doing enough to talk about and, and to warn people about democracy under siege? Well, not to toot our own horn here, but I, I think Bob Woodward and I have done as much as we could over the past three, four months since the peril came out in September to say that democracy is under threat. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And and I, I know we know each other a little bit, Bill, but anyone who's worked with me knows I'm I'm kind of the opposite of a dramatic guy. I'm an old school reporter. Mm-hmm. I value being an old school reporter, nonpartisan, get the story right, be tough on everybody. Uh, but I spent nine to 10 months with Woodward digging into this. And my reporter's assessment, my conclusion after talking to hundreds and hundreds of people for hours about what happened at the end of the Trump presidency and what's happening now in the States is that this is so real and uh, what happened. It, it was so dark that you can't look away from it and you can't, as a journalist, uh, start saying, oh, it was just an episode. Uh, this was something that was a reckoning for American democracy, unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime, and probably we've seen in a, in a very long time, because the whole peaceful transfer of power, which even with Nixon, Nixon gets on the helicopter and people are going out to dinner that night in Georgetown. There are no riots about mm-hmm. Nixon. Uh, this this is a totally abnormal American experience. What happened on January six? And what we painted in our book is a picture that shows this wasn't just about Trump being idle on the day of the insurrection. The most important takeaway I had as a reporter, and I hope this comes through in the book, is that Trump may have been idle on the day itself watching TV. And we hear people talking about that from the committee this week. But the most important thing is that Trump was anything but idle. He was leading a coordinated pressure campaign which others will judge whether it was a criminal conspiracy or not, but it was certainly a coordinated pressure campaign to overturn an election, uh, prevent Biden from taking office, and at the very least, uh, make it almost impossible for Biden to govern. Trump did this with intent. He did it repeatedly. He pulled every lever of power, whether it was judicial, uh, legal, uh, political, leaning on his own vice president, lawmakers, state officials. He did everything possible with intent to overturn an election. And and that happened. And so uh, moving forward, what's the role of journalists? I think it's stay cool. Uh, This is don't get emotional about it, but be as aggressive as possible in telling the story and telling the truth. I was uh, just checking here because one of the things you just mentioned, I had made a note of in terms of Donald Trump's role uh, as early as June 22nd, you report on page 131, Uh, He tweeted out, millions of mail-in ballots will be printed by foreign countries and others. It will be the scandal of our times, right? So he basically set the whole big lie in motion six months before the election. He did. And and, and history is going to ask questions about people inside the White House, inside the administration, like Attorney General at the time, Bill Barr. Mm Mm-hmm. Where was the line uh, of enabling uh, what was really done to try to pull him back? Maybe nothing was. Because what we really see is a culture inside of the Trump administration in the spring of 2020, summer of 2020 period, where it becomes one of desperation. And there's a scene in the book that sticks with me where Tony Fabrizio, Trump's pollster, is with him in the Oval Office. And he says to Trump, you know, voters are fatigued by how you're handling the pandemic. They're fatigued by how you're handling the job as president. And he says to the effect something of they're fatigued while I'm effing fatigued. And uh, everyone's silent. And Trump was frustrated. And he, in 2019, had tried to stir the pot on Biden and Ukraine. We don't need to get into that. Led to an impeachment. He then stirs the pot again with the Hunter hard drive and playing that up at the end of the campaign. He's And also the most important thing he's stirring up is the idea of fraud before the election even takes place. And while at the end, people like Bill Barr and, and Pat Cipollone and others are saying to Trump, there was no fraud. This was at the end in November or December. This isn't during that hot summer period where Trump was unbound. 
Another of our colleagues who has been sounding the alarm, of course, is Bart Gelman, in, in most recently in The Atlantic, uh, where he says that um, January 6th, don't think of it as a one and done, right? It's a dress rehearsal uh, for what's to come. Do you share that fear? Well, that's exactly the phrase that Millie uses in our book. Was this a dress rehearsal? Yep. I mean, Millie, uh, based on our reporting, privately refers to the Russian Revolution of the early 20th century, which was a dress rehearsal, for, uh, 1905, a dress rehearsal for 1917. And he wonders, was January 6th, the 1905 revolution that no one talks about really, the first Russian revolution, which leads to a bigger revolution in 17. And Bart Gelman, his piece is provocative and v very deeply reported and and well done. And I think it's very much in the same current of peril, which is Trump has set off an entirely new hurricane of norm changing in almost a redefinition of the truth in American political life and American constitutional life that we're still kind of grappling with as a press, as a, a media, uh, as a country. And I, I love Gelman's approach, and I hope we had it in our book as well, to just be vigilant to this is happening. And the most important thing to do, I've noticed, with a lot of people, sometimes when you start talking about democracy under fire, they go, oh, every, everything's fine, because I get it. A lot of people don't pay attention to politics every day. The most important thing is to give people facts, new facts that are irrefutable, and try to help them understand what's happening out there. So it doesn't sound like my opinion about things, but it's just saying, here's what you really should know is happening. Uh, and that's what you do in your book, I must say, in both 2020 and 2021, step by step, almost day by day at the Pentagon, in the White House, uh, in the Congress, uh, around the country. You know, Robert, I was struck reading Peril, um, and I realized that how far you and Bob had gone in warning America of the danger. Uh, I went back to what really stunned me, uh, knowing Bob for a long time and having read every one of his books, by his last book, Rage, where for the first time, I think, as a reporter, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bob Woodward himself said it's important, uh, if I can use a phrase, to step over the line. I want to read the last sentence of his book, Rage, quote, when his performance as president is taken in its entirety, I can only reach one conclusion. Trump is the wrong man for the job. Uh, that was a significant moment in Bob Woodward's professional life. Uh, is it a conclusion you share as well? It was a significant moment in Woodward's life. I actually did a story for the Post about that book, uh, the first story on that book, and I remember reading the galley copy of Rage and coming to the end of the book with, where, where Woodward makes that statement, that conclusion. And I looked up at Bob and I said, "Whoa, that's different right. for a, for a Woodward opinion to be in a book, a conclusion about a president. It's because it's so different than Bob's." usual approach. But Bob was right then, and he's right now. Be because what Bob and I have discussed at length, what he was doing at Rage was not offering commentary. He was offering a conclusion based on reporting. And I don't know how you can look at peril and read it carefully and not come to a conclusion that this, the same one Woodward came to with Trump on Rage, which is President Trump was someone who at every turn, especially at the end of his presidency, tried to use the office and his constitutional power for personal political means that went against the constitutional flow of the country that led uh, to total disruption in the transition period and ultimately included an insurrection under his watch. Uh, and that's the dictionary definition uh, of... That's the antonym of what a presidency should be about. Uh, that, that, that's kind of someone using the presidency against itself. Would you go so far as to say that any reporter today who does not recognize and um, and maybe assert and warn of the undermining of our democracy or the attempts to, uh, that any reporter who does such is not doing his or her job? Well, People have different jobs. I'm not going to weigh in on people's specific jobs, but I think broadly speaking, you're making a very valid point. I, I, I would compare it to this, Bill. Think about the steroid scandal in sports and, and baseball 
Mm -hmm. A lot of people knew it was going on. It corrupted the sport uh, in many respects for years. But a lot of it went unreported. Now, a lot of it did get reported, but some of it didn't. And people make choices in life and journalism, what to cover, what not. And it and I would argue it's not a sports writer, but steroids deserved far more coverage at the time as something that was really at the center of the sport. And even though sports was kind of more fun to cover in a lighthearted way, the sport was being actively corrupted by steroids and it probably didn't get enough attention. Just like now, people may like the red and blue aspect of politics, who's up and down, campaigns. And that's fine. I enjoy that aspect of politics too. I'm a political junkie. That said, the main story of our time is the actual undergirding, the foundation of this entire system. Democracy is under active threat uh, and eroding in many places. And so even if you don't love the, the direction of where the story is going, that is where it's going. And it's the responsibility to cover the story as is, not as you want. So let's, t- let's talk about a very um, specific challenge uh, that's facing us now. January 6th is Thursday. Uh, The United States Congress will be holding a prayer service to commemorate that awful day, that insurrection. Donald Trump will be holding a press conference at the same time in Palm Beach, Florida. We know what he's going to say, right? It's going to be the repeat of the big lie, the trumpeting, trumpeting, if I use the word, of the big lie. How should we deal with that? Well, you have to cover it, but you don't need to cover it live. Um, this is mm-hmm. something where Good I point. would argue as a reporter, you're judicious in how you approach it. I believe people need to know what Trump is doing. I'm a big believer in covering Trump vigorously. For example, Trump uh, on Monday issued an endorsement of Victor Orban yeah, I was going in to Hungary. About that. Right. And, right. And that's something that deserves coverage. An ex-president's endorsing a far-right leader in Europe – Okay, that's something that deserves coverage because it's so surreal, but it's happening. It needs to be documented, needs to be explained. You don't not cover it, but you cover it in a way that really explains to people the significance of what Trump's doing and what he's saying, and then providing context if he's if he's offering a lie on the election. And I think that's what needs to be done with these press conferences. Let people know what Trump is saying, uh, but spell it out if he's lying about the election. Uh, in totally unfounded claims about fraud, you have to articulate that. Um, but but you don't want to just f- if you ignore Trump. Here, here's the thing I always thought about Trump in 2016. The media got criticized for covering Trump too much in 2016. I always thought that was a a, a wrong assessment. You could argue his rallies were covered too much. I actually thought Trump was not covered enough. His personal relationships, his financial dealings his business history, his political relationships. He was undercovered in 2016 because people didn't think he was going to win. His rallies were overdone in terms of coverage. But Trump deserves enormous coverage, but doesn't need to have live unfiltered coverage. Uh, I know you're also, Robert, as a student of American history. Uh, Have we ever had a president in our history who's been a former president who's been so disruptive uh, once he left the the Oval Office, I mean, no one in modern history. I was thinking, thinking about this the other day. I mean, Nixon, yeah, leaves and goes back to California, San Clemente, and he wants to re rehabilitate himself for history. But he, he he's he's in political winter. Reagan, of course, for health reasons, is in political winter. Clinton does his foundation and he helps his wife's campaigns. I would say Clinton in a political sense, is probably the most active of recent presidents. Obama's around, but still busy with his documentaries and speeches and foundations. Carter, not as a political figure, but very active in his post-presidency. What do you think, Bill? I mean, I did, that's well, but, my assessment. But, but, but certainly none of them as negative, pointedly negative about their successor, right? Even Bill Clinton, as I recall, right, was not out there uh, attacking George Bush. And sometimes Carter would be critical of people's foreign policy decisions, right. but he wasn't an act. No one ever thought Carter was going to run again and be so untotally disruptive. Robert, you mentioned a few people in the book uh, that I want to ask you about and their role in the Trump presidency uh, and beyond. Uh, let's do that right after a quick break here on the Bill Press Pod. Of course, our guest today, Robert Costa, co-author with Bob Woodward of the great new book, Peril. 
on the Bill Press Pod. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. And today's podcast is brought to you by the American Federation of Teachers. Yes, Teachers of America doing God's work every day. Under the leadership of Randy Weingarten, 1.7 million strong, the members of the AFT, teaching everything from pre-K up through grades 12 and into higher education as well. On the front lines in America's classrooms, getting kids back into class and still dealing with COVID. God bless them. We thank them for their great work and their support of the Bill Press Pod. Check out their website at AFT.org. And we rejoin Robert Costa here on the Bill Press Pod. Uh, it's a new book with Bob Woodward, The Peril. It'll scare the hell out of you, and you will uh, end it like I did, saying, boy, it's lucky we survived those two years. Uh, everything that went on. I want to ask you first, Robert, about before we get to some of the people, covid the role of COVID, would you say COVID was the number one factor in the 2020 election and how, how Trump handled it particularly? No doubt about it. He uh, might have won if he had handled it differently, told the truth? Well, I, it's hard to predict whether he would have won. I mean, Trump at the end is so unmoored from any kind of coherent strategy. Our book shows his advisors are, are really unhappy with the way he zigzags from talking point to talking point. He has rallies that don't really have a theme. He's angry all the time. He's lashing out at critics and the media and on the and the pandemic's raging. Uh, and all those things are a factor. I also believe Biden uh, at the time was, he was able to offer himself up as a seasoned pair of hands. And it, it's, it, it was almost the right candidate for the Democrats at the right time. And uh, it was hard for Trump to really find a way in on Biden and, and the kind of things that Trump got to stick on Clinton about uh, her perceived relationships with her foundation and foreign leaders and big business didn't stick with Biden mm -hmm. in the same way. And so uh, Trump, I think so much of Trump at the end was in part, uh, it was about the suburbs and men and women walking away from his handling of the pandemic. But it was the whole Trump experience for so many voters I encountered had become exhaustive. Uh, and they were ready to have someone a little bit more low-key come in. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. <laughs> 